Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, I suppose courage is the ability to control your fear. Yeah. And that's, yeah. so I think when you can control it, and that doesn't mean uh, that that comes easily. That takes a lot of practice. And yeah. where do we get that practice? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's in the most unlikely of spots. It might be, you know, the, when you fall in love and you're afraid or you, when you are you know in high school and trying to figure out what table to sit at or will you be rejected or you know the first phone call that kind of thing but we do learn in various ways to control our fears and not be kind of pushed around by our fears and i think once people get into that sense of wanting to have a grip and be in control there's less likelihood that someone would say and and what i really want to do is kill another human being my guest in this episode is Kathy Kelly, a renowned US peace activist, author, a founder member of Voices in the Wilderness, and now coordinator for Voices for Creative Nonviolence. Kathy is a longtime resident of Chicago where she is heavily involved in community organizing. She has traveled to Iraq over 25 times, including during the early days of the Iraq War, and she has spent time in war torn Afghanistan and Palestine. In the course of her activism, Kathy has been arrested over 60 times for her nonviolent actions and has served several prison sentences. Now in her mid 60s, she continues to travel the world as a courageous voice for peace and justice. She's a truly remarkable woman, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing from her. Kathy, an absolute pleasure to have this opportunity to interview you. You're not long in the country and uh, we've just met up and you've already told me that you've quite the famous uh, family <laughs> legacy in, in Ireland. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Oh, no, I don't think I should claim fame, but it was um, I, my brother back in uh, the United States when he learned what I had learned from having met my Irish second cousin, who is a senator in your country, said, uh, you hit the mother load, <laughs> because we learned so much more about our family background after that conversation. My mother was an indentured servant, the Presentation Sisters in Listowel. Um, I, I, perhaps we're doing one of the kindest things they could do for uh, children whose mother had been, uh, well, died in childbirth. Um, the dad wasn't able to take care of the children, and so my mother was sent to wash floors eventually in a monastery and ended in England at a boarding school as a servant. And uh, I suppose for women in her generation who you know, escaped the workhouse, as I would have learned today, I, we visited a workhouse here in Dublin, uh, working in a boarding school might have seemed like a bit of a dead end, not the worst, but then World War II happened, and for some women, like my mom, it meant uh, a way to perhaps find work that was maybe a bit more interesting because the men were off to war. And so my mother um, met uh, my dad, who was a soldier, and then uh, my first sister was born here, and the rest of us were born in the United States. Wow, that's quite a story. And uh, so did you grow up with a very clear consciousness about your mother's story, or did that... <laughs> Not so much. No, it took a long time to kind of squeeze out of her that she had been engaged to a Royal Air Force pilot and he was declared missing in action. And then she married my dad and she gave birth to my sister and then the Royal Air Force pilot came back. (laughs) He wasn't missing at all, you know, and he apparently said, Captain, I'm home and there she is with child in arms. So there was a lot of drama, I think, in her young life. Um, and she, you know, would probably, were she alive now, have a great deal of sympathy and empathy for people who became refugees, because in a sense, she herself had to seek refuge from a, a, a home that couldn't sustain her. As did many Irish people over the years and sadly still do. In, you know, I was with a group of high schoolers this morning, um, such lovely youngsters, and 
I mean, it had to seem like a sort of strange day to them. We first went to um, a workhouse outside of uh, Dublin and then onto the graveyard for many of the people who didn't survive at all in the workhouse at, at you know, young ages, 120 were buried under the leafy ground that we, uh, we stood on. Uh, and it was, um, for Joe Murray of Afri, a way to help the youngsters connect with the fact that just, you know, one generation, two generations ago in their own families, people were fleeing Ireland and fleeing famine and understood hunger all too well and starvation and disease and death. And so might we have extra affinity for and sympathy with those who are in those plights today? And just bring me back as well to um, the relative, the, the particular senator. Uh, this is, uh, I think you mentioned an O'Sullivan. Uh, Ned O'Sullivan. Ned O'Sullivan. He's he, close to retirement. I okay. think this, is, in fact, is his last year. And I didn't realize we were second cousins, but Listowel is an amazing little town. I had, from my brother, had gotten um, one line about the street where my mother grew up and, and one line about the graveyard. And so I walked into the place where I knew I could get Wi-Fi in the morning, and it happened to be a bar in Listowel. And, and the woman there said, oh, well, it's the male person you'll need to talk to. He'll know about who lived on Carmody Street, uh, on Convent Street. Well, that was Vincent Carmody, the male person. But he was not doing his male duties that day, so I asked the other mailman. He said, oh, Vincent Carmody, he'll be, he's in Chicago right now. He'll be back on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. <laughs> So I, I, of course, you live in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, but I quickly realized that everybody knew everybody in that town. So in no time, you know, Damien Stack had put me together with Patrick Whalen, who put me on the phone with my cousin, who was the senator. And, that, and that's when I started to learn more about the family history. And apparently our uh, grandfather, uh, and for my generation, my mom's dad, was a tailor. But he and the other tailors were also... Uh, planning ambushes and very much a part of IRA battles and uh, I, I'm I'm curious you know I I myself grew up um, persuaded by pacifism after I turned 25 and really thought about it and uh, and yet I do I suppose believe that that people want their lives to be aligned with their deepest beliefs and for those who deeply believe in, well, in killing uh, in order to get what they want, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me, I suppose, that that's how they would live their lives. It makes me very, very, very sad. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, you've been in war zones all over the world and it, war is a, and violence is a difficult thing to really come to terms with in any way when we believe in the mm -hmm. goodness of humanity. And then you take context like the, the the civil war the war of independence this was presumably a hundred years ago your grandfather uh, was active and I sometimes think that what would I do if I was there and it was my family under attack mm -hmm. or my wife or my children mm -hmm. under attack me there, there may be I don't know more of a male inclination to go out and protect the family or not and I don't mean to gender it in that way mm -hmm. um but I certainly would like to think that I wouldn't as well. Uh -huh. I just don't know. It is, uh, um, well, it, it seems to me that there are an, a, a variety of options for, for f finding and expressing courage. I think everybody feels fear. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Everybody feels fear. And... Uh, Sometimes when I'm fearful, I can become very reactionary and just react. And I think that sometimes the reaction that's favored in our societies is to pick up a gun and then react yeah. or you know, yeah. have a bigger weapon. But I think that what I've learned is mostly from an older generation than me, people I sort of adopted as grandfathers. Uh, and they were pacifists who who said to me, well, I suppose courage is the ability to control your fear. Yeah. And that's, yeah. so I think when you can control it, and that doesn't mean uh, that that comes easily. That takes a lot of practice. And yeah. where do we get that practice? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's in the most unlikely of spots. It might be, you know, the, when you fall in love and you're afraid or you, when you... 
are you know, in high school and trying to figure out what table to sit at or will you be rejected or you know the first phone call, that kind of thing. But we do learn in various ways to control our fears and not be kind of pushed around by our fears. And I think once people get into that sense of wanting to have a grip and be in control, there's less likelihood that someone would say, and, and what I really want to do is kill another human being. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I like what you're saying there. It, it's almost like the more connected with mm. themselves that they are. I, I often wonder about that and the concept of nonviolence, that it's not really a non at all. Uh, it's actually an active. It's, well, you know, you it's know. interesting when you think about people who are refugees who choose to run. In a way... They're choosing one of the most, let me use that word, nonviolent options. Because if, they, if a person stays in a situation where you might be killed and then your family might feel like they're obliged to try to fight back or um, you might be maimed and then you feel like you have to fight back. If you, if you choose to stay in the situation where attacks are being made, um, th- there will be a, a set of options that many people would say are the, are the best options or the only options. And they're, they're, they can be very, very violent. But if you run away, and some would say, well, that's cowardice. Mm. But I don't know about that. I, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure it's too cowardly to try and get across the Mediterranean. And exactly. And face a, a boat that is very, yeah. very dicey. And you know. I think there's an estimated, I've seen different figures, but in and around 5,000 deaths last uh, year. You yeah. know? So it's a graveyard in itself, the Mediterranean. Mm, mm. And in a way... There's a lot of talk, obviously, for good reason about the U.S. now and Mexico and refugees. But Europe has a lot to really Mm -hmm. contend with ourselves. We have no necessarily a right Mm -hmm. to go shaming other countries for their inaction. And one of the methods of warfare that has been the cruelest, I think, is is economic warfare. When we I, I was part of a group that went over to Iraq in 1991 and that warfare was called Desert Storm, and, and it was terrible. Every electrical facility all across Iraq was wiped out. But over time, always you know, too late to have made the necessary difference, we started to realize, well, wait a minute, the sanctions, the economic sanctions are more brutal, more punishing, uh, ha- more harmful towards civilians, especially children, than even the worst of the bombing. And I think that that kind of economic warfare, maybe when it's not as dramatic as economic sanctions, you know, comprehensively imposed by the UN and the US and every other nation, uh, nevertheless, is, you know, when people are squeezed out and they can't get work and their economy is dominated by warlords and uh, invading forces have helped the warlords gain more control, then, you know, how are they going to feed their families? And, and wouldn't, who wouldn't make the choice to try? and get away. For sure. I think sometimes that we think of uh, terrorism or war happening uh, by men necessarily almost in uniform with guns, but quite often those men might be wearing suits with exactly. pens and laptops. You know, it's so interesting. I, um, I do go around to a fair number of high schools and once they hear that you've been to prison, <gasps> a year in prison. <laughs> Is it a year in total over several times? No, no, no. I did a year in maximum did a full security year. Um, and then uh, three months here and three months there and uh, another couple of weeks. And I can but, see why they put you in maximum <laughs> security. Yeah, you, you, I see you <laughs> shivering right there across <laughs> from me, right? And I... <laughs> I look like a cross between Mary Poppins and... Uh, and, and, and you've had, you've been in prison several times. Yes, yes. But, you know, people think, oh, that's where you meet the bad sisters. That's where you meet the really, really dangerous people. And I, I always think to myself, well, no, I think if I was in the salon of a, you know, very uh, well-endowed military contracting company, those would be really, really dangerous people. They're making nuclear weapons or these factories manufacturing acid rain or, you know, the people in charge of the tobacco industry. There's a lot more killing that goes on because of their output, their product, if you will. But yeah. it does look yeah. so very, very yeah. civilized. The mask looks it quite does, good. It does, yeah. I, I talked to, I had the privilege of meeting Aaron Swartz uh, in Boston a few years ago, who's sadly now uh, not with us anymore. But Aaron talked about uh, the idea of moral mazes, that in today's society, um, 
A is not necessarily next to B um, in terms of the production line or in terms of how everything is organized. Mm. So what tends to happen in terms of climate change or in terms of pollution in the river or the Gulf oil disaster um, uh, or sorry, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Nobody's ever to blame for anything because I was just the guy who was doing the report or I was the guy who was in charge of the rig mm-hmm. or and there's a moral maze because n- nobody's ever responsible. But yet we are mm-hmm. all complicit mm-hmm. to some extent if we are helping grease the wheels of and those machines. Then gets even more confusing, I think, because Exxon um which is, was presided over by uh, Mr. Tillerson, who is now the Secretary of State for the United States, was one of the companies that knew early on just how horrible climate change was going to be. It was something like those in the tobacco industry who knew just how much uh, illness and death tobacco smoking was causing and yet uh, continued to uh, kind of obfuscate the reports or deep six the reports or get somebody else to make a, you know, pay some scientists to make a dissenting report, but they knew. And Exxon has known for years just um, what to expect because of global warming, and they, they've covered it over, papered it up. So now um, Exxon has the leasing rights to vast, vast acreage of uh, oil fields within Russia. And with the sanctions, they couldn't really enact it. They couldn't make the billions that they stood to make. So now it's the perfect bow. Uh, Vladimir Putin can go back to earning money on his oil. Exxon's going to make billions and billions of dollars. Uh, Donald Trump gets to be the deal maker. And so you lift those sanctions and you've got your perfect bow. So the Game of Thrones becomes clear yeah, now. And then you look back to Iraq and if you imposed the sanctions, you had the perfect bow because you got Saddam out of the picture and you could control the pricing and flow of oil. And uh, okay, so along the line, 500,000 children under age five are sacrificed, killed. These sanctions killed those children. The UN said so. And um, it, it seems to me that the mask is so difficult, as you say, it's so difficult to identify who's accountable for the killing. Yeah. Uh, when they can uh, put yeah. on such a yeah. uh, an acceptable mask, and well, now with Donald Trump, you know, he doesn't really have much of a mask. I don't think he he yeah. he sounds and he looks like a a, a dangerous, yeah. unpredictable character. But actually, when you think about it, in pre- previous administrations within the United States, and I imagine within Ireland too, there were people who were engaged in some uh, pretty sinister actions. But it looked so much more amenable. Uh, and so that's another task that we have, is trying to remove the masks and, and then also see ourselves as we really are. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about... Um, I, I'm kind of intrigued by uh, Trump's kind of Christian base and, and the juxtaposition between what is supposedly the values of Christianity, of love and justice and peace, and some of the values that he's espousing and some of the behaviours that he's demonstrating and how Christians can reconcile that. Um, but then I was kind of thinking about it on a local level. So sometimes you think globally it gets too abstract. So if I think to a small town in Ireland where there was endemic abuse going on all mm. across this country, there were people in that town that knew. There may be many, many people in those towns that knew. And at what point does it take a village to prop up uh, duplicity almost? Mm. And so is that where the the individual human being has the ability to kind of hold both the light and the dark, but to turn a blind eye to the darkness when it suits them? Mm. So, you know, I I, I don't know. I'm still trying to tease this out because in some ways... um, it's this sense of complicity, and I think Ireland's complicit right now as well, and particularly with this ban on uh, people from seven countries. Um, the, we have US preclearance in two of our airports, and the general consensus within government seems to be that the so-called Muslim ban is wrong, but yet our complicity is fine. But we can just blame you guys. We can blame Donald Trump, but our bit doesn't really matter because we're just like, down the, you know, so who put the, 
who put the oil and gas in Hitler's carriages and, and mm-hmm. who, who fed the troops? Uh, my first trips over to Ireland were um, with the Sisters of St. Bridget of Kildare saying, Cathy, you'll be coming to Ireland. What? Because I was in Baghdad and we were saying we're going to stay there uh, because we think the war could start any day. And they were so sensitive to what was happening at Shannon then when the uh, pit stops were being made. The U.S. warplanes were making pit stops to refuel and get ammo and drop off and pick up soldiers at Shannon. Still are. Still Yeah. And, um, you know, Ireland being a neutral country, this was a belligerent act and it would clearly seem to be against the rules. And so I did come and talk about the economic sanctions about children and families and um, what we'd seen and heard. And then uh, five people called themselves the pit stop plowshares and they did two and a half million dollars worth of damage to a U.S. Navy warplane parked on the tarmac. And that then turned into three years of trial. And I came pretty regularly as one of the defense witnesses. And because you're allowed the necessity defense in this country, and because they had brilliant lawyers, Mr. Nix, who passed away, was uh, someone who should be, I think, studied in every high school and college class on rhetoric. Uh, Brendan Nix and the other lawyers uh, succeeded in persuading the jury that uh, these five should be acquitted on all five counts. And I, I think about the courage that they had at that moment to decide that this was something they could do to try to stop the war, even though there were so many, many people who turned out on the streets and didn't want to see the war go forward, there was less inclination within the United States for people to say, okay, not only am I going to turn out on the streets, I'm going to risk arrest and maybe sit down on the street and maybe that war could have been avoided if people had been uh, a a bit more aware of their responsibility, of their accountability. Yeah, I think they, they, to some extent, they held up a mirror to society and it was a beautiful thing that they got acquitted in the end, I think. Well, and then it was a beautiful thing that the Irish activists in Derry recognizing that Raytheon was making the bunker buster that had uh, caused a little girl to die in her best friend's arms uh, and her mother to say, well, who are the terrorists? You know, those little girls died because the force of the explosion imploded their internal organs. And I remember I met the mother in Lebanon during the funeral, and uh, she was wearing a medical hood and a neck brace and you know, it's some considerable pain to herself. She pointed upward, and there was still a drone going overhead, you know, to do surveillance. And so she fixed me with a look, and she asked me. I didn't even know what drones were at the time. She said, didn't they know? Didn't they see? My Zahra, just she stay at the nighttime in that building. Then she comes back to me. I pick her up. I give her breakfast. Well, these Irish activists got her testimony, and they were so moved. They went into the Raytheon corporations at um, office time, you know, and opened the windows and pulled the computers out of the wall and dropped them out the windows, crash, crash, crash. And I thought, oh, this group's not going to be acquitted. And they were because of the necessity defense. So who can take those kinds of actions that say my responsibility is um, not fully enacted until I, you know, go to the max of what my imagination and my moral principles will allow me to do. Not everybody in the community can. And there is where I think community is so important. Um, Because we can discern with others, you know, okay, you're a young mother, maybe this isn't the time for you to act, uh, but you're an older activist, someone like myself, and, you know, maybe you can (laughs) go ahead and stand out there this time or you know, see who, but, but but then have backup and support and have it feel as though the whole community is being yeah. drawn in. I sense more of this is going to be happening now that Donald Trump and Trumpism are predominating yeah, in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really around the time of George W. Bush that I kind of, my activism really kicked in and I started organizing and and I can now see uh, this is going to be a whole new wave because Trump, the Trump regime, and it's not really about Trump, it's about Rex Tillerson. And, Trumpism. Yeah, Trumpism. Uh, but I've started to call it the regime and the resistance and the regime. Um, 
and not not to simplify it either but i i can see that a whole new generation now are potentially going to uh become active and well really I'm depending on them to become active Well, I, even the seatmate the, who was on the plane on the way over here uh, said to me that she had gone to Washington DC that she never has been in an action she's never picked up a leaflet before but but she felt she must go to Washington DC that was the woman's march yeah the and then um, yeah. she said as soon as she got home she found in her kind of upscale gentrifying neighborhood Uh, a small group that's committed to anti-war work and she's going to start going to regular meetings. And I was with some students just uh, three nights before and they said the same thing. They they came out to a small meeting. Uh, So I think you're right. We will see um, an enlarging and I hope a deepening of movement activism. And I hope that those who are most in need of protection, who are often the poorest among us or the the ones that get shipped off to jails or the ones who uh, are uh, lonely and economically disadvantaged. I hope that these are the people who whose needs will be put forth uh, as the most important. I think if you do that, if, if basically the poorest among us become our top priority, then I think a lot of other things sort out. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that I mean at the core or one of the main factors that led to the election of Donald Trump in that the mm-hmm. Democrats failed the poor? Well, there's a very interesting book out by a woman named Arlie Hochschild, and she was a Berkeley professor who decided I'm going to go live in Louisiana, which is one of our southern red states, right on the coast, and try to understand over the course of five years how people are thinking and feeling. And I think feeling is the word. I think many people um, felt, and they were. it was true, they felt that they were being ignored and that their um, cares and concerns were neglected. And the blame was placed largely on the Democrats. Now, what's difficult to understand is how, given the, okay, so in the red states, we, we have red and blue states, and the red states would be the more conservative, and the people living in those states would tend to be completely against any kind of regulatory laws that would say to investors, okay, you have to comply with these regulations. They'd be completely against government intervention. Well, in those states, people live five years less than people in the blue states. They have much higher rates of uh, teenage pregnancies, family breakups, uh, higher rates of uh, health concerns and disease, um, terrible environmental conditions, and so vulnerable. Louisiana, with that long coastline, so vulnerable to flooding. These are the people who need regulations that will say that there, there are standards for health care, there are standards for education, there are standards for environmental protection. But they aren't being rational, I don't think, when they say we don't want any kind of regulatory uh, intervention. And and when they see such groups as being uh, inimical to their to their best uh, best hopes for their children. So it, it's a bit confusing. I don't think that demo- democracy has really been practiced very well by the Democrats or the Republicans. I think democracy is based on education. And that's where we're lacking. Um, people who identify themselves as liberals need more education like the kind that Arlie Hochschild tried to get. We need to understand yeah. why people felt neglected and uh, what would help solve their problems. But a lot of people who just as a, mm, not a matter of principle, but just as a matter of taste, I suppose, will analyze sports and engage in all kinds of discussion about entertainment won't read the newspaper about foreign policy, about wars, about the ways in which uh, the United States has been manipulating other parts of the world. So they really, really don't understand very much. Is that also about access to media? Because what we've seen over the last 20 years is the evolution of the Fox News era. And like mm. news has become a kind of a redundant thing in one way. It's, it's this 
it's entertainment yeah. it's not news and so you really need to work harder to get mm-hmm. news to and i think it's part of the military industrial media congressional yeah. complex it, it's complete brainwashing i mean yeah. I, I heard a, a, an american woman or a u.s uh, lady interviewed on radio the other day she was like the chairperson of the local um, republicans but she t- she talked about uh you know, foreign policy and saying, well, we're sorry, we can't go around saving all these countries around the world anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. It's costing us too much. And but the basic premise of her argument is so far off reality that she thought that these were troops going to, you know, save Iraq. They, I mean, she actually believed it. I, and, it's and just stunned me, even though I, I would come be. back and talk to college graduates who were my peers and be coming back from Iraq, and they'd say, oh, Cal, how was it over there in Iran? And I'd say, oh, no, I was in Iraq. And, and I'd get this kind of puzzled look, like, oh, there's a difference? And um, So I, I, I don't think we as U.S. people can let ourselves off the hook too much in terms so is, of how, yeah. how much acquiescence there was to sports and entertainment yeah. becoming... The dominant thing. And if children think, are raised to think, oh, soccer yeah. is soccer is what counts. Your mom's a soccer mom, and you go play, uh, and and your mom plays with you, and your dad plays with you, and play, 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 and watch TV, and uh, you know, then it's Christmas, and then it's time to you know chase the Easter Bunny. Well, people are going to be so caught up in the national religion of shopping, and in sports, and in entertainment. There's no time to try to pick a country, any country and really learn or or understand more about it. Now, maybe that'll change because of diversity, you know, people... Yeah. I mean, look, I I can see that I personally think there's a huge role for sport, okay, in that it it serves a real Mm community-building function, and it's a tribal thing. It brings people together, and, you know, it it prevents people killing each other in in one way and Uh helps to do it over a ball or whatever. And these days, so many people have such stressed and pressurized time poor lives that sport can be their downtime and their outlet and it can serve to mm. counter obesity and all of that so i i do think an over religious element of sport can be a problem in that i lived in glasgow for a while and and i got involved in this in people actually believed that celtic and rangers football clubs <laughs> they were like an ideology like so they they got lost completely on reality um but some of this conversation is just making me think really as you said the value of education and good education and i keep thinking about finland and how they've revolutionized their education Mm -hmm. system because when um when they had an economic collapse in the 80s they realized well they're going to have to do everything differently and they started with education and now t- at a very minimum to be a teacher, you need a master's degree and teachers are seen and held as some of the most esteemed uh, workers in society. And the way teachers are becoming in Ireland and I know in the US is that they're being devalued. And so that's saying that we don't care for our kids' minds and the nourishment of their minds. So. I, I, and, and but but the, the issue here is that this new education secretary in the US, she she doesn't give a shit either, does she? <laughs> I, I mean, don't think she I, understands I mean, she, very much. Yeah, either. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, don't mean she doesn't, she's... you know, care. She cares for something, but um, it looks like it's a road to privatization and commercialization of education. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, I'm from Chicago, and we had a march down what is called Chicago's Magnificent Mile, each person carrying a 40-pound cross. They were very heavy, and each cross was dedicated to an African-American or Hispanic youngster who'd been killed, coming from three neighborhoods in Chicago, just three neighborhoods. And there were 762 people killed in one year, 58% more than Los Angeles and New York combined. And... The military operates so many um, junior reserve officer training corps uh, facilities. We call it ROTC, teaching 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth graders to use weapons and to become inured into the military. So what age is a 6th grader? Uh, we're talking about 10, 11, 12, So the military 13. gets in access to so them at 9,000 Chicago, by and large, black and Hispanic youth, are enrolled in these military training schools. And that's the only evidence you can see of big money being 
put into education. Uh -huh. These kids go on parades. Um, That's for, like Hitler Youth. That's well, obscene. what I want to say is the, 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 most ex the, the most expensive clothing those children will probably ever wear are those uniforms as they're marching down the street. That's and you can see a sea of faces, maybe one or two white faces in the entire group. So, so from three neighborhoods... People, there's mass incarceration, um, all of the stigma and disenfranchisement and unemployment and yeah. family breakup that comes with that and, 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 and tremendous violence. And, and the reason it was so important to do this walk down the magnificent Mile Rich Street was to say this is a Chicago problem. You can't say to the people who've already been you know, cut off at the knees, okay, now run, solve your problems, get with the program. We've held rail to jail meaning these young kids either go to jail or join the military or become addicted or die young. And I don't see this new uh, Secretary of Education waking up in the morning puzzling over how she's going to solve that problem. Mm. And and that is, that, that's why I think if we could kind of almost make it into a given that you take the cons cares and concerns of the poorest and the least protected in your community and boost those up above everybody else. Even, you know, the very um, uh, exciting aspects of identity politics. I mean, I know it's exciting for people to say, I identify myself as this and I'm oppressed or I'm persecuted and I'm not going to put up with it. And that's good. I mean, people should be asserting themselves. But I, I think if we aren't at the same time saying, uh, and, and what can I do for the person who's even more oppressed than I feel, uh, then I, I think we lose a big opportunity. And that's what I learned from kids in Afghanistan. You know, I, I taught high school for about 14 years, and I never thought at age 64 my main mentors in life would be a group of 13 and 14-year-olds, but they, they teach it to me. They, they themselves come from just this close to destitution, and yet as soon as they get a little bit of security, I see them turn around and reach out and try to help somebody needier than they are. It's remarkable. When's the last time you were in Afghanistan? I came back in December, and I'll go back at the um, end of, well, middle of March. Uh, will that be to the same place or community? It's always been to the same community. I'm so fortunate. Um, there's good interpretation all the time, and... Um, my young friends are starting to learn English, and I'm getting better at uh, Dari, which is a derivative of Farsi. And I always feel um, welcomed and humbled and able to learn. And it's something I want other people to be literate about, in a sense. I want people to have literacy in the cares of people who bear the brunt of our wars. How do you decide which uh, campaigns or actions or acts of service to take on next? Is it an inspired mm -hmm. call? that? I suppose there's a lot of intuition. I mean, I, I will say I do wake up every morning these days thinking, hmm, what if we moved to Esfahan and Natanz? And I don't quite know who we are, but if teams of people went to Iran and moved in, and, and said, um, you know, we know that Esfahan is a city of flowers. We know that uh, people in Natanz have great pride in your cooking. So we just want to know about your flowers and your cooking and your children and your culture and your language. And uh, yes, there are also centrifugal machines that uh, would make these cities uh, targets in the crosshairs if the United States were to attack. But I want United States people to know as much as they can about ordinary Iranians interacting with ordinary U.S. people. Now, that's a bit pie in the sky. I get that. I mean, we would have Iranian intelligence following us. If, if you go into somebody's kitchen and they'll be there when you go out asking what did they say, most likely, if it's like any other country with a strong autocratic or oligarchical uh, sort of surveillance yeah. system. But I still think we we should be thinking along those lines. So mm, I don't want to at all walk away from Afghanistan. And I think that the prison population in the United States should always be visited, and, and I should do that by being a prisoner myself. Um, but I, I guess one thing we have to accept is if you spread the peanut butter too thin, the bread rips. Yeah. So we can't take on everything. Okay, so how, how, do, you, uh, how do you deal with that? 
area of self-care and self-discipline. Uh, and you know, thank God for novels and well-written books. Uh, I think that's what really sustains me. Uh, I can uh, just revel in, uh, delight in. Uh, what kind of books do you like to read? I like novels written by authors uh, outside the United States. I, I've, I've learned so much ever since I was 17 or 18 years old from international authors. Um, I try to read the New York Review of Books, stodgy and all as it might be, um, uh, because I don't want to be at all stretched. You know, I don't want to just have my head in the sand of what I'm already comfortable yeah. with or know a little bit about. I want to be prodded to know new things. Um, I, I don't like to do too much exploration of ideas and thoughts uh, online because you end up sort of going too fast. Uh, it's important, the research is needed, but you can sort of fill your brain and, yeah. and then not really know what's in there. So, uh, and I've been, I'm very impatient with Facebook and uh, social media, but maybe I'm sure it's because I'm not adept at it. Well, uh, I'm a bit suspicious, though. Yeah, no, I think you have a point. I, I woke up this morning and uh, I checked Facebook and I saw that several people shared several fascinating articles about Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, instantly I had the choice to make. Am I going to spend the next two hours reading these articles? All Trump what, all the time. To what point? You know, now, it becomes an addiction in itself. But... Mm. I do also feel I have an obligation to keep up with this. And it, it's a f phenomenal thing that I'm getting referenced all these articles. But I also need to be out in the world doing something about it as well. Well, I suppose in a way, if I was a top strategist trying to advise Donald Trump and I believed in this kind of shock and awe approach, I'd say just disorient your opposition. Yeah, there, there is do, some analysis. Do an executive order every day. There is analysis that, that is saying that that's exactly what's happening, yeah, that yeah. Uh, Bannon and, and those folks are uh, engaged in some sort of coup politics whereby they, it is shock and awe and that eventually they, they'll be like an outrage, fatigue will set in. Mm. And there are some theories that eventually they, they will replace Trump. Um, uh. You know, which... You, you know, that's that's a whole other area. But like if we look at U.S. foreign policy in Central America and elsewhere, regime change isn't mm -hmm. <laughs> is in the practice yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the U.S. is not this black and white place. It's it's uh, there's it's the same as everywhere else. There are good forces and bad forces. And I, I think uh, I think I'm still hopeful, you know. Well, you know, I, I, I talk about the perfect bow and how, you know, outrageous it is that Exxon could uh, make such a financial killing, if you will, in Russia if, this, if these sanctions are lifted. But on the other hand, if we don't go to war against Russia, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, so yeah, it is yeah, possible yeah. that somebody yeah. who is a reckless and a dangerous person yeah. and who is irascible and says misogynist and racist remarks could do some things that are useful yeah. helpful yeah. maybe not for yeah, the best and, reasons and it's quite possible that Hillary would have went to war with Russia sure yeah I mean that uh, yeah. I'm from Illinois and we haven't had a budget for higher education or social services for over a year and yet the Illinois National Guard Air Force was going over to Poland and doing military exercises on the border as part of NATO deployment and the European initiative resolution or something I'm sorry not to have that quite right but EIR and and loads of money was made available for that yeah. and to bring Polish uh, people over to the states yeah. and then they can all learn how to operate drones together yeah I think we'd rather have educated kids wouldn't that be great yeah. <laughs> as an alternative to having robots that are going to end up possibly defying their orders and yeah. proliferation of these robots everywhere yeah so uh, how, how long are you going to be in Ireland now? Is, this is your speaking at the AFRI event, obviously. Are you taking some more time? I am. I'm a bit um, embarrassed about this in a way. You don't have I'm, to admit it I'm here. not <laughs> one who usually um, uh, sits still for very but you're long. You're not coming on a sun holiday, I know that. No, that's mm. true. I wonder, do you think there's still a sun out there? Is it? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's out there somewhere. Yeah, it's not exactly a holiday, but I, I, I'm not like Wendell Berry. I'm not a great essayist, but I have done a lot of writing over the last decade. 
and I haven't um, really tried to sort it or scratch around in it and see is there something like a book there. And Not that I think the world needs another book necessarily, but it may be that if I don't um, try to put together what I think is the thread that um, would weave through these various war zones and um, peace endeavors, um, it, they, they would just sort of be like pickup sticks falling all over the floor. So I'd, I'd like to see what I have and see if I can't come up with an outline. So you're on a writing mission? Maybe. <laughs> I think you are. And in fact, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to do that because I agree that the world doesn't necessarily need another book, but it does need another book by you mm. uh, because you have this rich range of experiences and insights. And it's, it's maybe not my right to say an obligation or a duty, but you have all these stories from others well, and that it's so need to be told. Well, that's... Um that, that does motivate me and also just I just did that on purpose to try and get an angle well. <laughs> <laughs> but also being the, the duty thing. in the Stowell where my mother grew up and, yeah. and seeing her story and, and feeling yeah. that um, to some extent uh, just I, I just want that little town to be known because although my mother experienced uh, hunger and privation and probably a lot of sadness and loss I could see it had a perfectly beautiful little church and there was salmon in the river and it was a, a lovely town and I would imagine that most of the families living there now had histories that weren't uh, dissimilar from my mother's and, and they've made of their lives something um, very homey and, mm. and uh, congenial it seems. So I, I, who knows, maybe after I'm there for 10 days, I'll think, get this woman out of our hair a bit. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Tell them you're writing a book anyway. That's a good start because there uh, is a, do you know about the Stowell Writers Week? Yes. Yeah. Well, I've known about that. And there's also this wonderful museum, which was actually curated by my cousin Ned's spouse oh, great. in part. Yeah, she had a lot to do with yeah. the, the museum where you, you walk in the room and it's set up to look like a famous writer. And, yeah. uh, and then, um, you know, the, the Blasket Islands writers have... Um, really charmed me a lot. Yeah. Now there's definitely something about the West of Ireland in general um, mm. that there's still a kind of a stillness more so than a lot of the urban centres. <gasps> Isn't uh, that true? Yeah. And I think in one way that could be um, an act of activism these mm. days is an act of stillness. Isn't that interesting? To stop yeah. feeding the noise and yeah, to stop talking for a while. Everybody should stop talking. <laughs> we should stop talking. <laughs> yeah, but it's noisy, mm. and uh, I work a lot in uh, kind of youth, youth mental health and community ah. mental health, and I know for a fact I can see it. I, I've read the reports. I talk to people all the time, and there's a lot of dis-ease out there. And that is manifesting itself in anxiety, particularly anxiety. Mm. The levels of anxiety are through the roof. <gasps> um, depression, mm. self-harm, eating disorders, um, addiction and suicide. Mm. And then we have, you know, other forms of that in terms of self-medication with people coming home from work and drinking a bottle of wine several nights a week. and. I mean, I, I'm not against any of those things in terms of having a drink and so on, but um, there are a lot of people just hanging on, mm. not living necessarily. And I do think it is important to reorganize ourselves as a species that mm. we have richer lives that don't necessarily require us to be economically richer. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but the busyness is a thing that you'll find that like, most people seem to have this problem with busyness. But mm -hmm. where the hell did this come from? And mm -hmm. I do think technology has a role to play in, like you said there, you know, it's, it's speeding things up yeah. and feeding. Well, you know, the first time I went to prison, I went for a year and mm, I, I learned a lot. I learned Spanish, I made some good friends and it was, it was a pretty interesting year actually. The next time I only went for three months and it was so hard. And I realized in part it was because back in the day when I first went off to prison, there was no cell phone, no internet. There, there wasn't anything to withdraw from in terms of instant gratification. But that next time around, it was very difficult not to have the instant access and not to feel 
hooked in and, and to let go of that and just, you know, grow where you're planted. And I, it, it took about a month before I could really sense that I, I was settling into where I actually was. And then this most recent time, gosh darn if they don't have internet inside the prison again. <laughs> I'm not again, but but I again had access to to internet. You can get in a federal prison, you can go go and put yourself online and answer all your email. And, um. oh. So is it? Uh, no, that's a kind of separate thing. I'm trying to figure out. I've, I'm intrigued at how Chelsea Manning has been tweeting, but I think that's something through the phone line to the lawyers, oh. which is amazing that uh, we have this person and hero really in my eyes that. Uh, has been communicating with the world through Twitter from well, prison. I surely hope that she'll get a full sense of how much the world, I, I have to cry, how much the world has appreciated her. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, well, hopefully now we'll, that she's due out in prison in, in very soon. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there and, and there are many other Chelsea Mannings out there too that need our <gasps> solidarity. Oh, and, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I often, I, f- I just feel strongly about whistleblowers and anyone that does take that act of courage, resistance, action, that they're doing it on our behalf as well. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. we can give up some of our comforts and luxuries to mm. give them some, some I've, support. I've seen that in writing from you before, I think. Um, and... Uh, we don't know what's coming around the corner, do we? Um, who would have ever known, who would have guessed that an Oscar Romero who was a very conservative bishop who was on the side pretty much of the paramilitaries and the landlords would turn around and become the, a voice of the poor in a way and you know that still has him leading people in Central and South America yeah. even though he was yeah. assassinated decades yeah. ago. I'm seeing that um, some unusual... Um <clears throat> actions in the last week from corporate America um, acting in solidarity with refugees and migrants um, making these I, I don't want to name companies because I don't want to give them advertising <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes you have to be maybe a little bit cautious is this real or is this marketing mm-hmm. in its own right but no there have been some bold acts by business leaders and, and I think that business leaders and church leaders and um, not just your usual Voices. We need people mm-hmm. from such a diverse, mm-hmm. diverse range because these issues don't belong to the left or to the right. No, you know, they, no. they're issues of humanity. And I think, um, you know, the, the veterans of U.S. wars going down on their knees and begging forgiveness from the Native American yes. indigenous people Standing at Standing Rock, Rock. Yeah. that, that yeah. kind of went all around the yeah. world. And so yeah. it opens up new possibilities yeah. and idealism and altruism. Um, my young friends in Afghanistan went out and stood in front of their putrid, horrible, dried up, polluted trickle of a river, what once was the Kabul River. And they just had a sign saying, we stand in solidarity with Standing Rock. Don't let what's happened to our river happen to your beautiful Missouri. And they sent that months and months ago, and it, it actually got to the elders, and you could tell there was a connection there. So, you know, the, that's the good thing about our interconnected world. Yeah. We really are all part of one another. And the internet can help us in that regard. It yeah. can yeah, indeed, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's one struggle, really. Yeah. And, of course, these kids sort of know about Chelsea Manning, and there they are living in the most conservative Muslim country in the world, and we're trying to tell them about Chelsea Manning. And So, you know, times can change. Yeah. I'm particularly hopeful when I think about the the majority of the population of the world is under 40, actually Ah, under 25. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, they've got a big chance and some big decisions. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look who voted for uh, for certain forces, you'll find that they weren't necessarily young. So Mm. uh, so I do. I am hopeful when I talk to young people, they know what's going on and uh, they need some guidance and eldership to maybe help them a little bit in terms of the acts of courage. But yeah. And also, if we could not only say we've got your back, but we also know that you're being graduated from your universities for those of you who go that route, like indentured servants, because you're in debt sky high. And so if we could say our resources aren't going to be hoarded to be passed on to just one narrow group, but that we would really try to give people the resources to follow what they really want to do in their lives and not be, you know, 
hijacked. Exactly, exactly. I, I think to try and break that narrative that life is, is short. Mm. So we need to get on with it and write our <laughs> books and so on. <laughs> so. And go to Afri tomorrow for Fela Berita. So thanks very much, Cathy. I really well, enjoyed the conversation. You. What a, what a and, delight uh, it was. I look forward to attending your book launch in Listowel. In oh, course, uh, well. <laughs> wouldn't that be some nice poetry? Mm, wouldn't that be about a decade from now? <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. Cam. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Love and Courage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast, rate it and review it and spread the word on social media and wherever you can. While I love doing these interviews, they take a lot of time and effort in research, production, post-production and publicity, and there are some costs involved. If you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow, it would be really appreciated. All contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. And this support helps me to help others in the community in my day-to-day work. My sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways. Also, just to say, I sometimes take on social change media, communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations, workshops and schools and colleges community centres and at conferences. Topics range from mental health and personal development to youth and community empowerment, leadership, activism and social innovation. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, please let me know. So to get in touch, to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now, log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org. Thank you so much for all your support. Until next time, here's to you, to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us.